Good evening, folks. Welcome. I'm Jennifer LaRue. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. I'm so delighted to see so many people in the audience uh, this evening. A lot of familiar faces and names uh, and many newcomers. So welcome to you all. I see my friend Linda is out there. Hi, thanks for, for joining us tonight. Um, I have to say, I look forward to all of our programs. I'm particularly looking forward to tonight's um, because of the two people who are speaking and the subject matter. Um, and I'll, I'll say more about Sophronia and Barbara in a moment, but I just want you to know that you are in for a very special evening, uh, as am I, as I get to sit back and watch the show with you. If you are um, having trouble with your tech, as I see a couple people are, I'm sorry, that's just kind of the nature of the beast, Best thing to do is just to exit all the way out and come right back in. Uh, probably all you'll miss is the rest of my remarks, which is no big deal. And do know that the program is being recorded and you can always watch it on our website. Um, and you can actually continue the chat on our website. So usually I introduce the chat as a feature of Crowdcast. You all have already discovered it, so I don't need to say too much about that. Please do continue to communicate with one another throughout the program, though. That's really part of the fun. And it's kind of like the silver lining that we've all discovered in uh, this virtual world we've entered. Um, we found these new ways to make community, and that's one of them. But I do want to point out that uh, toward the end of our program, Sophronia and Barbara have agreed to do a Q&A. If you have a question for either or both of them, if you would please put that in that area called Ask a Question that's at the bottom of your screen. That makes it a lot easier uh, when I pop back up at the end to help manage the Q&A, uh, if I can see all your questions in one place. And also, it's kind of easier for you because you can go in there during the program and see what other people have asked. And if you have the same question, you can upvote it, and that kind of moves it to the top of the pile. So um, please do take time to enter your questions in there during the program and we'll get to them toward the end. Um, uh, before I introduce our guests, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Mark Twain House. You know, we're a private nonprofit uh, institution and the past year has been really tough on us and we've really been pleased to be able to be uh, active and engaged and connect with our communities through these virtual programs that we've been running uh, at, 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 at kind of a fear pace uh, since last April. Um, and during most of the past year though, we have been without our major source of revenue, which is our guided house tour. I'm thrilled to tell you that we are back up and running. We've uh, recently introduced uh, limited house tours and we're uh, kind of adding more people now that the CDC and the state say it's safe for us to do so. Um, they'll be fully masked still so everybody can feel safe, but we're letting more and more people through the house. And that is certainly helping us uh, look forward uh, financially. But it has again been a rough year. I will let you know that I and every other member of staff, including our executive director, have been furloughed a day a week. Um, since last summer. And, you know, it's um, it's been a challenge, uh, one that we've all embraced because we love Mark Twain and the Mark Twain House so much. Why do I mention all of this? Because you can help. Uh, there's a button right underneath my face. It says Birdies for Charity adds 15% to your donation. So typically during these programs, we do have this opportunity for you to click that button and make a donation to the museum. Um, right now is a very good time to do that because uh, the Travelers Golf Championship through its Birdies for Charity program actually adds 15% to whatever gift you might uh, be willing and able to share with us tonight. Um, so that stretches your, your donation just a little bit farther. And I just, uh, I always say this, but it's absolutely true. Every penny is deeply appreciated uh, by the staff and board of the Mark Twain House and Museum here in Hartford, and we put it to very, very good use every single penny. So thank you in advance for anything you're willing to do. Um, I will repost the link uh, for this in the chat in just a moment when I stop talking, but please know that uh, you have the opportunity to order a copy of Sopronia's new book, The Seeker and the Monk, that we'll be talking about tonight uh, with a foreword, foreword written by Barbara Brown Taylor, our other guest tonight. Now, we know there are other places you can buy this book, uh, but do know that if you purchase through us, uh, you'll be getting a signed copy, first of all, and also that your purchase benefits the museum, and again, it's very deeply appreciated. Uh, for those of you who do order the book, um, there's a little mishap with, with the signing process, so it'll be a day or two before we're able to actually ship those out to you, uh, but we'll get them out to you as quickly as we possibly can. So that is everything I want to say before I introduce our guests. Um, 
Sophronia Scott. Oh, I'm sorry. I do have one more thing. This is so important, but I had so many things. Uh, I do want to thank our sponsors. Um, tonight's program, like so many of these programs that we've offered, is sponsored by the Wish You Well Foundation and by Connecticut Public WNPR. And the program was produced in part with support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord, our, our beloved former trustee. So thank you for that support and help. And now let me introduce our guests. Barbara Brown Taylor is a best-selling author, teacher, and Episcopal priest. Her first memoir, Leaving Church, won an Author of the Year Award from the Georgia Writers Association in 2006. Her next three books earned places on the New York Times bestseller list. Taylor has served on the faculties of Piedmont College, Emory University, Mercer University, Columbia Seminary, Oblate School of, the the of Theology, and the Certificate in Theology Studies program at Arendelle State Prison for Women in Alto, Georgia. Her latest book, Always a Guest, was released in October 2020 from Westminster John Knox Press. Now, Sophronia Scott is an old friend of the museums. Um, anybody who attended our uh, first virtual Writers Weekend last summer will remember her memorable and stirring and inspiring uh, keynote speech uh, with which we kicked off the entire weekend. Um, and that's when she and I first worked with one another, and she's been a friend of mine and a friend of the museums ever since. Uh, she spoke at our gala last year, and um, we're delighted to have her back on the occasion of the publication of her book. A real brief she, and she has a very long bio that I'm going to just encourage you to read uh, in the back of the book um, rather than have me uh, read it all to you. But just to let you know, she grew up in Lorain, Ohio, it's a hometown she shares with author Toni Morrison. She has a BA in English from Harvard and an MFA in writing for Vermont College of Fine Arts. She began her career as an award-winning magazine journalist for Time, where she co-authored the groundbreaking cover story, 20-something, the first study identifying the demographic group known as Generation X and for people. Um, and I'm not going to read too much more. In fact, I'm not going to read any more other than to say that we're very proud and pleased to know that she uh, just took up, a, 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 I guess, a year ago now, uh, became the director of the brand new MFA program at, uh, in creative writing at Alma College in Michigan. And I'm sure she'll tell a little bit about that uh, once I bring her on screen. So, folks, please join me in giving a big Mark Twain House welcome to Barbara and Sophronia. Welcome both of you. Hi. I get to go first. I get to go first. I get to go first. Whoops, Daisy. Okay, one of you has Crowdcast open in more than one place and you're echoing. So I'm going to mute you both while you both check. Okay, sorry about that audience. Boy, we have been so much tech run and um, the tech gremlins are out to get us tonight. So Barbara and Sophronia, have you both checked to make sure you have Crowdcast open in just one tab and on no other devices? Looks like Barbara's gonna come back and join us in a moment. But Sophronia, I welcome you back up so we can chat for a moment. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm just thrilled to be here. I love uh, working with the Twain House Museum. Well, we love working with you. And you know, it seems, I mean, we're preparing now to do our second virtual Writers Weekend on July 9th through 11th. And it doesn't seem possible that it's been a year or will be a year anyway that soon, does it? No, and you, you mentioned the MFA program. We're about to have our first residency in less than a month. And yeah, a, a year ago, I was still dreaming this thing. And now we have students, we have a faculty and we're, launching and it's it's thrilling well congratulations that's amazing um and i know it's a lot of work for you as well i'm just checking to see if we've got barbara back and again i apologize for um she apparently works some lives somewhere where the, the the uh connectivity is not very good particularly at this time of day and so um we didn't have any trouble up until now did we sophronia uh no but here she is let's give her another try Let's welcome Barbara Brown Taylor one more time. <laughs> Wait a sec. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Is this working? Yes, we're good. <laughs> to everyone who's watching, I live in rural Northeast Georgia in a county with 42,000 people. And where during the last year, um, kids without computers at home had to go to McDonald's to do their homework in the parking lot. Oh, dear. So every time I have this kind of trouble, I do like to make a commercial uh, for <laughs> rural broad 
band and the ways in which those of us who don't have it go through this over and over again. So now, whatever you said while I've been gone, I'm so happy to be making my first visit to the Twain House um, and so happy not only to have written the foreword for Sophronia's new book, but tonight to be able to um, be her interviewer. I'm I'm her Barbara Walters tonight. So oh, wow. I'm so happy to do this and so happy to be with you, Jennifer and Sophronia. Thank you everyone for being patient with me while I got back online. Thank We're you. delighted to have you here and I'm gonna duck off now and you'll just let me know, Barbara, when it's time to, to jump back on and help with the questions. I will, I'll oh, do that. Great, thank okay. you. I look forward to hearing you talk. Thanks. So Sophronia, for those who do not know either of us as well as we know each other, I met you at a spiritual writers conference, um, which is, you know, a segue into what we're talking about tonight, which is what's it like to write about spiritual matters, the, the human soul in the 21st century. But I want to jump right in by saying that the subject of your last book, Thomas Merton is a buried treasure. And for those who don't know him, bear with me, I worked hard on this. Born in 1915, a well-educated wild child in his early 20s until he became a Franciscan novice monk in 1942 at the age of 27. You can correct me later. A best-selling author of his own autobiography in 1948. And I'd say arguably the most famous Catholic in the world until Pope Francis took the field, um, until Merton's accidental death in 1968. I think he was in his early 50s when he was at a monastic conference in Thailand. So that's the briefest thumbnail uh, that I can offer. But the question is, how did you and he come to know each other? And how did you decide not only to write a book, I'd say with him, not about him, but with him. And and how did you decide on the voice for this book? Because it's what compelled me to dive in. Oh um, goodness, Barbara! I, you know, I thought about that a lot. You know, that how how bizarre is this? You know, Jennifer mentioned I grew up in Lorain, Ohio. Never heard of Thomas Merton. Barely understood Catholicism growing up. And, but it was about ten years ago, actually, that um, I was in my own MFA program. And I was in a lecture, uh, listening to a lecture about gratitude, and the lecturer quoted an extended passage from Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, which is a book Thomas Merton wrote around 1966. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was absolutely tremendous. It was about the valley awakening, and it was about understanding that paradise is all around, and, and we don't comprehend it. And it just, I was just stunned sitting there thinking, what is that? What is that? And it was like, like he was talking to me. I was like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what he's talking about. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's exactly it. And I was, I just felt so alive and I wanted to find out who is this Thomas Merton. And, and I wanted to see that book. I wanted to look at the words right in my hands. So I, I, you know, went to my local library. Notice I didn't buy the book. Right. Usually I will hop on Amazon and order something, but for some reason I was being lazy and I ordered it via interlibrary loan from my local library, waited for a long time. And when it finally showed up, I raced to the library, got the book and fl started flipping through it, standing there in the library. And I couldn't find that passage. Hmm. And I thought maybe it's the wrong book. Maybe I remembered it wrong. But then as I looked closer at the book, I realized that there were pages torn out of the book. And that the part I was looking for had been torn out. And that just intrigued me more. It's like, okay, these words are not are important not only to me, but to other people, enough for them to tear them out of this book. So so it felt like there's something I need to be committed to here. So I need to go buy his work and start reading. Mm -hmm. And um, I read Seven Story Mountain first, which is the biography you mentioned. And I, I, you know, I was intrigued by him, especially the wild aspects of him. He, in many ways, reminded me of, of sometimes my brothers, sometimes guys I went to college with, I, you know, smart, sometimes annoying, you know, guys like that. But I felt like he was holding something back. Mm -hmm. And I eventually learned that his writing went through a censorship process because he was speaking essentially really for the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And so... I, I realized there were missing pieces, and I eventually learned about his private journals. Uh, there are seven volumes in all, his private journals, and 
they were published under the stipulation that they not um, come out into the world until 25 years after his death. Wow. So I knew this would be, and he, he wrote from like the very, in his early 20s, long before he was a monk, up until just days before he died. So these are extensive journals. And so I, I realized, okay, this is the real Merton. What, and why would I care? I Why did I want to know this person? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I got those journals and I started reading through them. And, you know, when you're in, and they're, they're thick books with tiny print. And to me, you know, listening to that voice of his one-on-one -on -one constantly, it felt like, you know, there would be times when I'd be thinking, yeah, yeah, I've, I've been through that too. And it felt like a back and forth. And, and sometimes even thinking about what he would say about something when I was dealing with something out in the world. Okay, so fast forward to me being a speaker at the Festival of Faith and Writing, which takes place at the Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, a friend who knew I was into Merton asked me to be on this panel. And I was sitting there on stage and I told the audience, look, I'm not an academic, I'm not a theologian. I just have this monk who follows me around and gives me advice. <laughs> and that's how I'm gonna talk to you about him, just my personal engagement. And, and I don't know about if this happens with you, Barbara, in your writing, but when people respond to something, I, I pay attention. And for some reason, the way I spoke about Merton that day struck people in the audience. They kept coming up to me even throughout the rest of the conference. Um, something hit home for them in, in that. And finally, someone said to me, you're writing your Merton book, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, whoa, I guess I am. Yeah. And, it, you know, and and there's so many Merton books. But yeah. suddenly I, I could see what mine would be and how it would be different, because this would be my experience of, of talking about Merton and, and my engagement with his work. And not just about him, but with him, truly. Uh, you reminded me of some quote, I'll get wrong, but it, it went like this, that literature is the means by which the dead communicate with the living. And it's yeah. so true. It's through writing that people come alive again, you know, that, that whatever people mean by everlasting life, it really can be true on the page. And then the spirit sort of, you know, make that a small S or a big S, whatever you want. But, and also if you don't know this Sophronia, your excitement's kind of contagious. I just want you to know that in case nobody mentioned it to you. <laughs> it's a little contagious, you know, but that imprimatur thing you're talking about, my daddy was a psychologist and he trained in the fifties, but he was raised Catholic. And he, I, I looked up all of his psychology books and his mother made sure they were approved by the Catholic church. He, he left that. Mm -hmm advice eventually but that's I didn't know until you just said it you could not read Merton's private journals until 25 years after his death yeah and you know some of his work is based on his journals you know books like the sign of Jonas a lot mm -hmm. of that came from his journals but he fought with the censors over that book there were things that that you know mm -hmm. they would not let him put in there so um so you really even though those works were from his journals it's not the unvarnished Merton there. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not Catholic. Um, I'm I'm what they call Catholic light as an Episcopalian. So are you come to yes. think. Yes, I am. But, but it, I, I am so happy that he came as a convert late in life to his monastic life because it made him a beloved antagonist of the church. You know, much in the same way Simone Weil was, you know, in her time of almost there, but couldn't, you know, couldn't buy the whole thing, could, couldn't do the whole approved doctrinal thing. So he became a beloved antagonist, a loving critic, you know, of his own family. And, and those are the kinds who get listeners like you and me because it sounds real it doesn't sound like a ventriloquist on someone's knee whatever yeah. whatever the doctrine yeah. yeah and and that encourages conversation right mm -hmm. and in feeling and you asked about the voice in in feeling a voice that is so willing to be raw and and loving and yet critical right mm -hmm. that draws the same out of me, you know, feeling my compassion for him as a person, but also feeling like, okay, uh, Thomas, you've gone too far here. No, <laughs> you know, you're not taking me with you on this ride. <laughs> but that's the part I love the most is when you would, you would never scolded him, but you would say, no, wait a minute, Thomas. And you even gave him advice at a couple of points, which I just thought was so 
we can't say ballsy anymore, but it was just so <laughs> ovarian or something. It was so amazing that you said, now, Thomas, it might help you if you thought about this. I mean, you didn't do that often, but when you did, I went, wow, she really knows him. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, there are times I, I really wish, I wish he were still alive because I, I would want to say, I, I want to help. <laughs> look, look, this might help you. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's wonderful. It's it's a captivating voice. And as I've said before, I felt invited in, you know, because you took him on in conversation and dialogue. I felt invited into that, both with you and with him. So it's a wonderfully inclusive book in that way. Everybody's welcome. Everybody's welcome to the coffee hour uh, with Sophronia and Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> and I will, I will also credit my wonderful editor, um, Valerie Weaver Zerker, because she... Um, you know, like you, she didn't know a lot about Merton, but mm -hmm. she also knew enough uh, to to make sure I didn't go too far down the rabbit hole and leave people behind. Yeah. Right? She, she would make sure, you know, she would say, wait, wait, take us with you. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, so yeah, I, I credit her for making sure I remained inclusive and that our conversation stayed open. It's one of the reasons I'm still kind of... Um appreciative of traditional publishing is there other people in the pipeline you know who, who take the thing we love and say no it needs to be tweaked a little bit or you know bring us in more now i'm going to seed the audience here a little bit because we we don't have all night to talk which i want and i've got lots to ask you about you write mm -hmm. fiction and nonfiction. you've got this new mfa program at alma college listeners, I am seeding some of your questions. But what I want to get to, because this wasn't a book you set out to write, you almost called to write it by the people in your audience at Calvin College. So how does a writer know when the book she's brought into the world has found its purpose, when it's doing its work? How do you know that? Well, with this book, I've been hearing amazing stories of, of people saying that they've <clears throat> found some aspect of their spirituality by coming to this book. So um, here's an example. And, and this is a story that didn't even come directly to me. Someone told me about this Facebook post of a, a woman who is reading my book and being envious because she feels that the, the mystical experiences that I'm describing never happened to her. She's like, well, you know, other people always have these experiences. Why is it never me. And, um, and then she's in the chapter where I'm talking about prayer and I'm describing praying with icons. And I describe Merton's icons. I describe the, the icons in my office uh, here in my prayer space. And she says, maybe I don't have the right icons <laughs> as if there are right and wrong icons. But, but she keeps reading and she decides to take her favorite icon off the shelf and hold it in her lap while she's reading. And she's reading and she's reading. And then she gets to a part um, where I quote John. And, and to her, she says, you know, it seems like out of the blue, Sophronia quotes uh, this passage from John and I'll even read it to you. It's, I am the good shepherd and I know mine and mine know me, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And then she says in her Facebook post, for the rest of this story, see photo. And the icon that she had chosen to take off of her shelf is the good shepherd. <laughs> and she and, and she says something like hashtag Holy Week, the mystery approaches. But here she is, you know, thinking that she's not connected to spirit, thinking that it's always somebody else. And then suddenly here she is in the midst of a moment where someone where she has this experience where spirit reaches out to her and says, yes, this is you, too. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I love that, that the book has provided this space for people. And I even say that, that, you know, this is my Merton, you know, I'm hoping that this book allows you to find your Merton and in other aspects of your faith. And that's exciting to me that, that people have taken that on and are finding that. So, so to me, it's, it's like the book has taken off and, and it has life. And that's, you know, to me as a, as a, a writer of faith, that's all I can ask for. I love it. And, you know, for anybody who, who who watched the word mystical go by or mysticism in what you just said, it's a confounding word. And I think everybody defines it in a different way. The way I define it is direct experience of the divine. And and in a way, your conversation with Thomas Merton in the book was unmediated, right? Unmediated by any superior, any authority. And 
in that same way, what happened with her and the icon was an un unmediated. You were kind of the mediator there, but it's this direct experience of the divine or the sacred or the holy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, it is electrifying when it happens. There's yeah. no go between. Um, so for anybody who heard that go by, everybody's vulnerable to a little mysticism. Like before you go to bed tonight, it may just happen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my thing is look for it. Yeah. It's probably there all the time and you just didn't notice it. Yeah. Yeah. The direct, because so often I think we're looking for gurus and nothing wrong with it. I've had a lot of gurus and a lot of mentors, but every now and then when, when the breath just comes straight into you like that and is exhilarating, there's nothing like it. So yeah. I'm in charge of watching the time. I just looked at the time. So I have um, <laughs> time for a little more. I do. This is one I want an answer to myself. And it mm -hmm. is, I'm very envious of you because you do write in multiple genres, you know, most notably, not just short form fiction and nonfiction, but long form. I looked up your bibliography today and noticed that in 2017, you wrote both um, Unforgivable Love fiction mm -hmm. Yeah. And this child of faith, nonfiction about yeah. you and your and your son, Tane. So in one year, those books came out. I don't assume they were created. But what I want to know is the difference between those genres for you and in particular about the freedoms and responsibilities of mm -hmm. fiction and nonfiction or any way you want to answer that. The differences between writing those two kinds of genre. Yeah, I, I love the freedom of fiction. And it's it's not just about being able to make up things mm -hmm. but it's being able to make a, a big statement that can be um, received by the reader more easily than if I were trying to you know make a statement right mm -hmm. so unforgivable love I'm I'm talking about all sorts of things about the way we are about sexuality the, the way we don't talk about it the way it makes us vulnerable to others because we don't know how to own our sexuality. Um, I'm talking about what is the concept of love and, and, and how we can grow into a, a love that is transformative. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that book provided the vessel to talk about so many different things and, and also to, to talk about this glamorous, um, a glamorous society of, of black people in Harlem, right? So I, mm -hmm. I wanted to write something glamorous and fun. And yet there are these very serious undertones. So it's like I can create a world, right? And and that's that's fun. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. And um and I owe something I owe things to my characters, right? So I'm I'm writing in service of, of them and telling their story. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a very different thing. Um I will tell you, Barbara, though, it's 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 tough on the, the publishers, though, because that also means that they don't quite know what to do with me. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like she's a historical fiction writer. Is she a spiritual writer? And, and you know, it's like it, it drives marketing people nuts. <laughs> what can I do? I write what I write. Oh, I love it. Please keep confusing all of that. <laughs> I, I, again, come from Georgia, where the person I would like to be governor right now writes in multiple genres as well. Stacey Abrams wow. also writes historical fiction and has just come out with nonfiction. And and she, too, you know, especially as a gubernatorial candidate, baffled people. Like, what do you write? What do you do? And the answer was everything, anything I want. <laughs> so, yeah. any, any way I'm gifted and moved. So. Mm. Um, in a minute, I have to give this up to the Q&A. Um, and I think I got to ask um, my my special questions there. But I um, I, I want to call Jennifer back in because she volunteered to help us with a QA. and a And I'm always interested in that because you and I knew what we wanted to say. But we haven't got a clue what they're going to ask us. I don't. <laughs> so this will be an unmediated experience with the people who are tuning in uh, mm. with us tonight. So Jennifer, come back, please. Come back. I'm back. Hi. Well, I, I do want to let you know, you do have a few more minutes if you wanted to continue, but we do have a couple of questions um, from the audience that we can turn to and kind of take it back and forth. And then I, uh, I have a question for you as well. Um, so you let's can go first. I give can you, I? You, yeah, permission. You as the host, I give you permission. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm invoking host privilege, as I sometimes <laughs> say. Um, you're both writers, and I am always curious as a kind of wannabe writer about your your daily process. Your, how do you get yourself to the desk and to the computer or wherever you write? We'd like to know how you write and 
uh, how, you, how you generate all of this, um, all these words and all this stuff for us to read. Hmm. Who, who was it, Sophronia said, you just sit down, open a vein and bleed. I mean, so yeah. some, that's, that's sort of my process is, and, and that's overly dramatic. But in, in the years that I have written, it's really a matter of loving and wanting to do it. Um, but then sitting in a chair so long, roots begin to grow into the seat cushion. But, you know, because I too am a spiritual writer, that ends up being every kind of time. That's social justice time and prayer time and contemplation time and and um, Holy Communion time and thinking about the community in which I'm planted time. But for me, it's really like um, getting in an elevator and, t and punching basement and just going all the way down as far as I can go into my language abilities, to my emotional faculties, to my purpose in this work and just sitting there until um, the roots become too painful and I just have to get up and go walk around and, and do something else. So usually for me that it is in a specific place every, every day because my body relaxes when I go there and knows what we're there for. Um, and it's usually about four hours long. And thank goodness somebody just wrote a book saying that's about as long as most people can do sustained work. So yeah, I'm glad I fit the research. How about you, Sophronia? Yeah. Uh, when, when I can be in a routine like that, it's, it is like that in the morning, uh, writing for two to three hours. Um, but then life happens. Like right now, we're getting ready to have this residency in less than a month. And so my morning routine is discombobulated. I'm about to you know, drive to Michigan starting tomorrow, um, but I'm going to have some time on the road in a hotel. And I'm, I'm looking forward, it's like, oh, I can spend the day writing in this hotel because I don't have to go anywhere just yet. <laughs> so it's like, I'm really excited to, to, to squeeze in that time because I'm, I'm working on a novel right now. But um, I have a writing buddy as well who, who keeps me on track like right now we, we write together twice a week in the mornings mm -hmm. so um and that's a virtual thing but um usually i'm, I'm project oriented mm -hmm. so it's like okay i'm working on a very specific book and i have a deadline and mm -hmm. i'm working until that's done mm -hmm. and i don't jump to the next thing right away so you know i leave that space um but i do journal all the yeah. time even if i'm not writing working on a project i do journal and Jennifer, these are two good answers because one of my most admired writers finally said to me, you know, if you write 20 minutes a day, that can be a book. Right. <laughs> In other words, you don't have to have four hours, you know, 20 minutes to be faithful to the process. Um, not only to want to be a writer, that's the noun, but to write the verb, you know, to engage the verb for any amount of time with some faithfulness, I think is, you know, gives you a wide range of answer to your question. Yeah. It's very, very encouraging, I think, to many of us. And and yeah. also both of you in talking about that, I mean, you started with that you know, open a vein and bleed thing, but um, honestly, you both sounded very joyful and very happy when you're talking about your writing process. Well, I heard some people, you know, treat it as such drudgery and, mm -hmm. and horror. Uh, so that was refreshing too. Thank you. Well, all that's horrible is the inherent narcissism, especially of writing memoir. So when, when you write a first person narrative, wow, to be in it and then know when to get out of it is very difficult. But that's another subject. Well, I hope you'll come back and talk about that. Sophronia, mm -hmm. did you have anything to add about that? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that um, I've, I've found, and this is a tricky thing, and, and this is something that I teach, that um, if you tell your story true enough, right, it will hit a note. I made said this in my keynote last year that it'll hit a note and it resonates in a way that other people start reading themselves into your story. And then it becomes not about you. Mm -hmm. It's about them. So True. it's, it's, so I'm looking, looking to hit that note. Yeah. One of my rules, um, even when my writing was chiefly for proclamation, you know, public speaking, it, it nothing went into the talk unless people listening to me could say me too. In other words, I couldn't really talk about, I'd never had a meeting with the Dalai Lama, but you know, you just wouldn't want to talk about that because who can say me too to that? No. So instead you talk about waking up in the middle of the night and worrying about things. People go, me too. <laughs> so yeah. just, you know, just That's stick with the universal. Uh, it, it strikes a note and yeah. Wow. 
Well, thank you. That was one of the most satisfying answers to that question I've ever had. So <laughs> thank you. So going to our audience, they have a lot of good questions, um, some of them very specific. Uh, Alan wants to know, someone once talked about altars in the world. Do you think Merton had altars in the world, either at the monastery or literally around the world? What or where are they? I yield to the Merton expert on this show. That would be Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, but, but he's re he's referencing your book. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, but uh, altars in the world. Well, he had in his hermitage, he, he had a ch uh, like a chapel, but he could do uh, communion and such. He could do like a little mass in his hermitage. So um, I mentioned he had icons. He had his own prayer space. Uh, even though he was in the monastery, he still kept to the same prayer schedule, I mean, in the hermitage, he kept to the same prayer schedule as the rest of the monks. You know, um, his copy of the Psalms, right? Like the, the binding is broken. You can see it at the Merton Center in, in Kentucky. Um, you can tell this book has been, you know, turned, the pages turned thousands and thousands of times. But um, but his main altar was that, that hermitage. And so much to the point that to me, you can still feel his presence there. So that's a good answer to where. And as someone, me, who served stone wooden altars, you know, for a lot of years, I now live um, in rural Northeast Georgia, as I said, and all of a sudden, you know, altars in the world, I just can't walk without cracking my knees on them. And trees in particular have overcome me lately. If you think about a tree, trees can't move. They can't run from anything. <laughs> and where I live, trees have seen the Cherokee removal and trees have seen the lynching of African-Americans in this country and trees have suffered the acid rain coming down on them and trees house these birds and their babies every year and trees, you know, accept the rain and take my breath away by giving me back oxygen. So uh, I would even, anybody here who wants to know where there's an altar in the world, go out and find a tree and, and just say something nice to it. And it'll make that tree's day, I promise. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I, I would add to that, Barbara, that um, Merton also, it, I think birds were a kind of altar for him too. Mm -hmm. Because the that passage I mentioned earlier from Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, he's, he's saying that, that you could tell what time it is by the bird songs because the birds wake at different times yeah. and you know that's fascinating and he mentions birds throughout his his journal right yeah. so to know them that intimately that he recognizes their song recognizes when they start singing right that that there's a there's a blessing of of life there that he's very respectful of yeah. I love that. I I, um, I knew somebody who fell into pretty deep depression and her assignment was to begin noticing the first bird that sang every morning. And when she turned her attention to that, instead of what was pulling her so hard down, things shifted for her. You know, it wasn't an overnight cure, but they shifted for her when she started hearing that first bird every morning. And that became, you know, when life began again every day. Wow. So you're, yeah, that, that reminds me of um, a friend of mine who, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Um, he, every July we would do, um, he was a photographer and he would have us do the bud and bug challenge. <laughs> so every day in the month of July, you had to post a photograph that you'd taken of either an insect or a flower. So what, of course that meant that you were looking Right, you were looking to, to look for that spectacular flower or bug that you wanted to take a picture of because you wanted to post something really beautiful. But it occurred to me as the month went on that my mind had shifted to looking for that beauty. Right? That, uh, and it was like that for all of us participating in this challenge, that suddenly our eyes were attuned to, to beauty and nature. Mm -hmm. And, and it, there was something very calming about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody, whenever people tell me we live in a terrible world, I always say there's a lot of terrible stuff going on and, and dot, 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 and, and surprising beauty. 
And I would add to those lovely thoughts, you both live in rural areas. I live right in the city of Hartford, just down the street from Mark Twain's house. And the amount of bird song that I am privy to here from my balcony in, in downtown Hartford is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. And it feels like it feels like, it, like a gift. Um, so I'm really glad to have connected with you on, on that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm giving Donald here a little pass. He's posed a question, but he's left it in the chat, but I'm going to go ahead and pose it anyway. <laughs> what do you attribute Merton's ability to span many generations and to have the great number of books about him? To what do you attribute those things? What a great question, Go, Sophronia. Well, first of all, he wrote a lot of books, not just about books about him, but you know, they, they published a lot of um, his work even posthumously. Um, but it's not just the amount of work, his work is so prescient, right? Um, especially um, if you look at a book like Seeds of Destruction, where he's talking about civil rights and race relations, it is it is eerie how relevant it is. It, he could have written that book today, um, but this, this is exactly where we are. Um, he was so uh, aware and understanding of what it what it meant to be alive in the world and our responsibility uh, to each other as humans to understand the unity of us, right? And, and the, our connection to divinity. And he was so, so human, right? So flawed and so human that to me, he's, he, that's what made him accessible, right? And he's speaking from the heart as someone struggling to understand his connection to God, to understand his place in the world, I mean, who, who isn't, you know, Barbara mentioned me too, who isn't in that place, mm -hmm. right? Of, of trying to be closer to God, of trying to understand one's purpose in the world, of trying to understand what in the world is going on <laughs> in society in general. And he spoke to all of those things so well, so very gotcha. well. And, and, you know, because I taught world religions through most of my academic career, interfaith, mercy. I, I inherited cassette tapes of Thomas Merton giving lectures, I think, to his brothers on Sufism, yeah. you know, the mystical yeah. branch of Islam in the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. he, you know, that's how he caught my attention early on was I was a child of the late 60s and he had just died and he and he was into every uncertainty I was of the Vietnam War, the social revolution going on then, the discovery of people, you know, all over the world who were very, very different from the people directly surrounding me. So he, he, he did see far ahead, or he was so tuned to where he was that he could feel the slightest little tremors that were starting to come up about things yes. and could make much of them while others of us didn't even feel them yet. Yeah. And he read so widely and, and not just read like sitting there with a book, mm -hmm. he read with pen and paper, constantly taking notes, constantly, in a way, engaging with the book himself, because if he something struck him, he would sit down and type out a letter to the author. <laughs> and, and, you know, and this is not like doing an email, he had to get permission to send this letter, had to find, you know, the, the person's address. And yet he, he would do that. He had, there are volumes of correspondence, because he felt that it wasn't enough just to read, he wanted to talk about things. Right. And I think a person like that, that engagement, that energy, and you used the, the word earlier, Barbara, um, contagious, mm -hmm. right? To be that engaged mm -hmm. with the world, both emotionally um, and intellectually, um, mm -hmm. and add to that spiritually, right? That's. Yeah. So some of those books are collections of letters, aren't they? That he wrote. Oh, Reco yeah. recovered correspondences he had with people. I'm always terrified to try to pronounce the name of Shejwa Miwosh, who was the, the Nobel poet. laureate poet. And he is a wonderful um, collection of letters. In fact, Merton uh, early on received a letter from Miwosh saying he'd been in California where his children had experienced television for the first time. Oh, and wow. he said to Merton, if, there, if there's any way you can use your influence to caution people against television because it is in everybody's living room and the communist regime would have loved that access to people's minds. Yes. In the fifties, these letters went back and forth. I, I, that's, um, there's a whole volume of those. And when, whenever I hear about that, that's the, that's the one letter I remember the most thinking about the TV. It's like, Oh my God. Even yeah, I lost that one. <laughs> you know. 
Do you think that Merton had any awareness that his letters would be published? Um, I, 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 maybe I'm making a wrong assumption that they were published posthumously, but maybe, were they published during his life at all? And did he? I'm eager to hear what Sophronia says. If I didn't want my letters published, I would burn them. I would not keep them. Let me mm -hmm. just say, anybody who keeps journals and letters is asking for it. <laughs> so, yeah. what do you think, Sophronia? He, well, you know, he can't control the letters that he sent to people, right? True. So, so yeah. those letters are, are letters that other people had, but um, he did burn there. He did burn letters, right, including the letters um, that. Um, he received from um, the, the young lady uh, he fell in love with um, in 1966, right? So those letters he did burn. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think, I'm trying to remember, because sometimes he, he did type with carbon paper. Oh, yeah. I, so I, I think it, it, it would depend on what he was writing and to whom. I did that a few times myself, and those need to be burned, come to think of it. So, <laughs> yeah, and you, Jennifer, you raised another question. If anybody here, you know, is a Bible reading person, did the Apostle Paul intend his letters to be published? <laughs> because that's so much of the New Testament. And my answer is, no, probably not. Mm. You know, he didn't sit down one day and say, I think I'll write part of the New Testament that yes. will become official in the fourth century after, you know, CE. So anyhow, it's a great um, question. Wow. Fascinating. And do we need to explain to anybody young in the audience what carbon paper is? <laughs> <laughs> That's before Xeroxes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Becky Ford has a really good question that um, some others have upvoted. It seems as though Merton's ecumenical dream kind of died. His east-west vision was so strong. Is anyone carrying the torch? Hmm. I, I, it seems to me that monastics still get together because it's not about um, beliefs. It's about direct experience or contemplation or, you know, it would be better for one of them to say this. But, you know, a lot of people get morning posts from Richard Rohr um, and lots of other people who are keeping ecumenical dreams alive, you know, who are speaking to wide varieties of people who, who do not share their tradition or wouldn't claim any particular religious tradition, but who hear the sound of what Sophronia was talking about. They hear the sound of the truth. They hear the sound of the real, the flaw, the flawed but, but sincerely engaged um, seeker. So I still see it alive, but it's never going to be alive in the central movements, it's going to be alive on the edges. You know, the, the ways in which people of different faiths or different understandings of the same faith get together will be edgy. It'll never be a central mainstream energy, I don't think, because most traditions have too much to protect. Hmm. What do you think, uh, Barbara, of when you have a project like um, like the Book of Joy, like with the Dalai Lama and, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu? I, mean, I, I think that that's uh, I don't know. I, to me, that's a, a wonderful step uh, in terms of, of talking about something, coming at it from, from two uh, different sides, but showing that it's still one belief and one conversation. Yes, like-minded people or like-souled people, those two. And they've got nothing to lose. You know, it makes them different from younger people who are on the same train of thought but but those two have have been through the wars you know and come out the other end and and they're gigglers i just cannot believe the desmond tutu and the dalai lama you know have been to hell and back and they just are silly sometimes <laughs> no. oh and i will just comment um of when we were having a little tech trouble at the beginning i was taking care of that and i forgot to set up my light so i my light is changing i'm so sorry it does it's not symbolic or anything. It's getting darker no. here. It's real, Jennifer. It's true. It is getting dark. It is. Well, thanks for understanding. Alicia says, can you speak to Merton's relationship and balance between the Catholic Church as an institution to his mystical relationship and, under and relationship with and understanding of God? Or what would he think of trying to balance those things? I'm sorry, My, ask that um, again. Yeah, I wonder if one may try that again. So uh, can you speak to Merton's relationship and balance between the Catholic Church as an institution 
to his mystical relationship with and understanding of God. So the relationship between Catholic Church as an institution and his mystical relationship with an understanding of God, or would he even think of trying to balance those things? Does that? See, I'm a person under vows. I'm clergy and I took vows and, and that leaves me in a creative and paradoxical position of straining, straining always against the boundaries that, that the vows laid out for me, but I want to keep my vows, you know, not only, um, to the church, but also to my husband and and to other people to whom I've made vows. And I, I, I have always sensed Merton would know what I'm talking about, that tension, that tension of the push and the pull. But he, he never left, did he, Sophronia? I mean, he, he, he moved his distance to the institution change. So tell me about that. But but he was very serious about those vows. Yeah. Right. Never, never turning away, always straining, lots of straining. Mm -hmm. But um, so, for example, you know, you, you would have thought, well, if he fell in love with a woman, why didn't he leave? And then I find out, you know, one of the reasons we have some of Merton's belongings, his clothing, is because of a, a monk and a nun who, who had his clothing. Um, the monk used to be at the monastery. He fell in love with this nun Merton encouraged them to go and get married, and they did. I'm thinking, well, why did he do that? <laughs> you know, he said that was right for them, but he couldn't do it himself. And I think it was about the vows, mm -hmm. right? And, and he knew that that it wasn't just that he was, um, you know, he knew that he was also an example, right? So it wasn't just his vows. He knew that people would pay attention to how he kept those vows, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, he, he was serious about that. Yeah, and what is it? Poverty, chastity, obedience, which can be understood very differently, very variously. And yet the obedience piece is, you know, a really difficult piece. And, and he certainly, you know, lived, lived with that. Um, but, but it can be a way of taming the ego over and over and over again. And mercy, didn't Merton have an ego? Let's talk about that sometime. But I, but I do think his vows in some way were a kind of tranquilizer, you know, or a, what? A, I don't even know what the word is, but but I think he knew that was part of his health. You know, yeah, right? and well, it's like there were two parts of him, right? He that 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 ambitious writer, and he he even said, you know, he was Brother Louis, right? That was his name in the monastery. He was Brother Louis, Father Louis, but he said this writer named Thomas Merton has followed me into the monastery and, and he whispers marketing ideas to me while I'm at prayers and, and book ideas, right? So, so you know, he knew that there was this part of him, who, gosh, will Gary Cooper play me in the movie if they make the movie of my book, right? So, so he knew, he knew that that ego was there and he knew that that ego, you know, could not run, you know, roughshod over his spiritual life. I love it, though, you tell the story also, though, about the brother he encouraged to go. I mean, it, 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 there's not one answer fits all, is there? It's, no. it's, it's what's your deep integrity and, you know, what, what's your fealty? And I think that can change, you know, that can change in one person's life, but it can be different for two people, three people, four people. So thank goodness there's not yeah. one for all. Yeah. Were there any movies made of these books? And did Gary Cooper have a role in any of them? No, not that I know. <laughs> Surely there are documentaries. I'm thinking of Martin Doblemeyer, who's made documentaries of Howard Thurman, Dorothy Day. But I don't know. I've got to go look up Thomas Merton documentaries now. So. There, there is. I've, I know of only one, and I saw it many years ago. Like It was a DVD in our church library. So but, he um, preceded I, yeah, if I mean he, he preceded most of that, you know, he he preceded the big heyday of the documentary. Hmm. Yeah. Now Evelyn has just added a question saying, "I heard that he had a child. Is that true?" That is true. That um, that was one of the reasons he got kicked out of uh, Cambridge, right? He had fathered a child out of wedlock, and. From what I understand, you know, there's not a lot of information around this, um, and I tracked down a document from a, um, it was like a blog post written by someone who had known Merton, like a close friend of his from college, and apparently that child 
died in one of the World War II air raids. And oh. he, he never met that child. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and he, he, only, he only alludes to this in Seven Story Mountain. That was one of the things where it felt to me like he was not telling the whole story because um, uh, Barbara mentioned, you know, um, he first tried to get into a Franciscan monastery and then he realized he hadn't told the truth of, he hadn't given all of his background. And when he told them about this, they suggested he go elsewhere, mm -hmm. right? And so in the book, I'm like, well, wait a minute, why did they do that? What, because he was a drinker in college? And, mm -hmm. but he, he doesn't tell that in the, in the book, mm -hmm. but that was why. Mm -hmm. So does that alter your feelings about him in any way or your relationship with him in any way that, um, I mean, that feels, to me, it feels a little disingenuous or something on his part. Disingenuous that he didn't mention it or? Yeah. But was that his choice? Mm -hmm. yeah. Remember, this is, this is a censorship thing. Yeah, it, right. had, to, it had to pass an editor. Right, yeah. okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Who, who would have that exemplar? thing in mind as well of course yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. if one if people had just an opportunity to just read one thing that thomas burton had written uh, what would each of you recommend sophronia oh goodness you know i i think it, it all depends on where you are on in any given part of your life but um i i like um goodness in his in in his sixth journal the sixth volume of his journal right and and i don't know if this is going to be of interest to other people but there's a section called diary for m and he essentially wrote out a portion of his diary basically telling the story of their love and he wrote all this out and he gave it to her right? but he kept his own copy right because we have it and it's in this book <laughs> So I, I just thought that that was so fascinating and, and so loving. And, you know, this was his statement that, you know, this can't go any further, but, but this was real. This was real to me. And I want you to know that I sincerely felt this, right? So, and then because, you know, I wrote Unforgivable Love. So I'm all about these love expressions. So that, that book is fascinating to me. Yeah, I don't know why in the world I think of the wisdom of the Desert Fathers because that's barely him, you know, but he collected mm. the sayings of the Desert Fathers and he has a little preface in there that is lovely, you know. So I also think about all the small pieces he wrote in setting up other um, resources and other teachers yeah. that should not be ignored. But as Sophronia said, he wrote so much. I think you could go down a bibliography and just wait for the bell to ring when a yeah. title or two sentence description comes up and say, that's where I'm going to start. Yeah. If you, you know, if you're concerned about social issues, go read Seeds of Destruction. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about spirituality, read New Seeds of Contemplation. Mm -hmm. You know, um, he has a volume of, um, uh, it was done posthumously of his material on love. Right. If, if you're thinking about relationships, go read that. So did he write Sin and the Birds of Appetite or did I just confuse him with somebody else? I no, I, I don't, that, I don't okay. know. That. No, you would know that. So. Mm. Oh, it is. It's Thomas Merton. Zen, yeah. Birds of oh, Appetite. Oh, Zen. I thought you said Sin. Sin. <laughs> I think you said Sin. I was like, Sin. I've never heard of that. Z E N. It's that Southern yeah. accent yeah. of mine. <laughs> no, Zen. Yeah. Zen. What a fascinating conversation. I can't thank the two of you enough. And I know our audience has enjoyed it as well. And they've been very active in the chat. I'll just remind people again that this has been recorded. I know that we've mentioned a lot of books and resources and, and um, so you can come back and listen and take notes a second time through if you like. I'd just like to know, um, first of all, just uh, to, uh, Barbara Sophroni is already a member of our circle, but you know, the Mark Twain house is a writer's home and a home for writers. And we're so glad to welcome you into our circle of writers. Uh, and we hope to have you here in person as soon as it's possible to do so. I think we were talking during our tech run about having you and Sophronia come and uh, do a behind the scenes tour of the Mark Twain house. And I think mm -hmm. you did worry me a little bit by saying you would probably hide in there and I wouldn't be able to find you. Um, so, but we have our ways, so that, <laughs> but we'd love to have you. 
microchip me when I come in. <laughs> and we won't have to do that. Thank you. Oh, but um, I think people would like to know where they can see you again next. People are asking about um, a festival, a faith festival. That, um, are you going to be speaking oh, at? Festival of Faith and Writing. Yeah. Uh, no, I can't. I'm trying to even remember when the next one is because. It got the, the schedule, it's usually only every other year and the schedule got screwed up because of the pandemic. I think it's next year, is that it? Uh, but at the moment, no, I don't have plans to be there. I don't even have the, the date in my head. <laughs> Well, you're yeah, going to be busy. We both, we both maintain websites and we've got our wits about us. I, I'm not on Facebook. I don't do social media in any way, but a web a web page and a Facebook page maintained by the publisher. But Sophronia is soaring right now. And I'm going into the hermitage of my forest dwelling years. So I only, I only come out for things like this. <laughs> well, we're glad that you did come out for this. Um, and I don't want to neglect to remind people that if you didn't have a mind to buy this before uh, our conversation tonight, I cannot imagine that you don't want it now. So please um, check out the link. Uh, they're not letting, the Crowdcast is not letting me paste it again. I think they think I've pasted it too many times, but um, <laughs> you just <laughs> scroll back up and find the link, please. And, and we'll get your copy to you as soon as we can. Barbara and Sophronia, thank you so much for being here tonight. And Sophronia, good luck with your um, your, your project at Alma and uh, with your you. residencies, your cohort coming in. Very excited for you. And um, Barbara, whatever you have um, in the pipeline, we hope that goes well for you as well. Thank you. Feeding the birds. Feeding the birds. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you to our audience for thank your you, um, great, great questions and for your patience while we got started at the beginning. I appreciate it. Thank Good you. night, everybody. Good night, Good night everybody. everybody. <laughs> All right, Crowdcast. <laughs> okay, well, Crowdcast thinks we should stick around, I guess. Um, so I'm just going to shut us down a whole other way. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Sophronia. <laughs> Bye. I, I think I'm just going to go to. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs>